This program is supported in part by a grant from the BNSF Railway Foundation, dedicated to improving the general welfare and quality of life in communities throughout the BNSF Railway Service Area. Proud to support Wyoming PBS. And by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. <laughs> While we're awaiting some of the folks to get seated, I again want to remind you, you're listening to the Governor's State of the State message here on Wyoming PBS. Again, I am Bob Beck. And again, this is a joint session the Governor will be addressing. He'll be talking about some of his priorities. The budget is the main thing they're talking about this session, but of course redistricting is going to be a major thing that they're going to have to settle and they're going to get to that redistricting bill very quickly. And again, during a budget session, one of the things that has to happen is there has to be two-thirds support of any piece of legislation that the legislature considers. And so the governor will certainly be talking about his priorities. But when you look at the last year, things have certainly improved. About this time last year, we all thought that there were going to be major cuts to the budget. There, in fact, were. Many of those budget cuts have been replaced, but not all. And that's certainly going to be a focus of the legislature, and the governor will be talking about some of those priorities. Um, some of the things that are different this session, of course, the state of Wyoming picked up American Rescue Plan money, and so they call those ARPA funds. There is legislation that will be introduced by the state Senate today that is going to talk about where that money would go. Expect a lot of debate on that because legislators certainly have some different views from Governor Gordon on where some of that money will be spent during this message, we expect he will be talking about some of those priorities. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, it is my pleasure to announce the following guests. The Honorable John J. Fenn, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Garou and Representatives Kinner and Williams. The Honorable Carrie Gray, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Ellis and Representatives Claussen and Oakley. The Honorable Lynn Boomgarden, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Cost and Representatives Newsom and Crago. The Honorable Keith G. Couts, Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court, escorted by Senator Landon and Representatives Duncan and Ottman. What they're doing now is certainly introducing some of the main guests. Uh, we've already, uh, we're seeing some of the judges who are being introduced from, uh, some from the Supreme Court. And we'll, let's see where we're at right now. I'm going to soon be meeting the new state superintendent of public instruction, Brian Schroeder making his first appearance, of course, before the joint session. We'll hear Kurt Meyer's name announced the here in just a second, Meyer, and Christy Racinas, so that's the state Senator treasurer Bonner, and state Reverend auditor. So what they do is they'll have these guests come in before the governor uh, enters. There's uh, Kurt Meyer, the state treasurer.
And here comes the state auditor, Christy Racinus. State auditor escorted by Senator All these Schiller. folks will be up for re-election this year, including Ed Buchanan, who will be after the auditor. So the session this year, again, as we talked about, is a budget session, and we mentioned that there's a number of other bills out there that will require two-thirds support. Wide range of things that we're going to be watching. There's some COVID bills that didn't get discussed during the legislative session. You've heard about a very controversial transgender bill. There's Medicaid expansion. So a wide range of things that could possibly come up. One of the things, though, legislators are interested in is how much time the budget session, but in particular the ARPA discussion, as we were talking about before, and the redistricting bill will take. If those fill a lot of time, then there's going to be a lot less time in this 20-day session to consider some of these other bills. So that's something that is on the minds of a lot of folks. And it's really going to be up to the... Speaker of the House and the floor leaders in the Senate uh, and the Senate president, of course, to determine what bills will in fact be heard. So that is, uh, that's something that's uh, going to be very interesting because some of these things may never see the light of day either if they think they're short of time. So lots of, lots of things happening. That was Kate Fox, the Chief Justice. Here comes the governor. I would like to invite the Reverend Father Thomas Crunkledon, pastor of St. Mary's Cathedral in Cheyenne, to please give the invitation. invocation. Please remain standing for the invocation. Let us pray. Lord our God, be with our senators and representatives, our elected officials, the members of the judiciary, and the personnel who assist them so that they may be good stewards of what we and you have entrusted them. As we begin the budget session of the 66th Wyoming Legislature, we do so on Valentine's Day. From at least the time of Chaucer in the 14th century until the present, it has been said that birds seek out a mate on this day, a companion for their life's journey. We have seized upon this example and we seek on this day to recognize the ones we love and cherish. We therefore ask you, Lord, to be with those near and dear to our hearts. Watch over them and protect them. Help us to love them more deeply and more fully. You also give us the example of the love of the gift of Christ your Son, and he showed us how to love by his willingness to give his life for us. As we begin the task of governing in this budget session, may we follow this example of self-sacrificing love of couples and of Christ, so that we seek not own our, our own self-interest in the legislation and actions we propose, but rather that we seek the good of all the people of the state of Wyoming whom we have been called to serve. As we now listen to Governor Gordon share with us the state of the state and Chief Justice Fox share with us the state of the judiciary, let us thoughtfully consider the challenges and opportunities before us so that with your divine grace and assistance, we may together be the public servants that we are and fulfill the responsibility to govern wisely and well. We ask this in all things in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Father Thomas Crunkleton. Members of the 66th Legislature, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I present His Excellency, the Governor of the State of Wyoming, Mark Gordon.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. President Dockstetter, Speaker Barlow, members of the 66th legislature, thank you for your welcome this morning. Father, thank you for your message. We'll keep it in our hearts as we move forward. Let me begin with a little bit of a shout out to a Wyoming player. I hope those of you who watched the Super Bowl last night enjoyed the fantastic performance that Logan Wilson put on. Now, I'm mindful that when he played for UW, they called him the governor, so just saying. <laughs> it is, though, with a heavy heart that I begin rem by remembering some friends of Wyoming that we lost this last year. Senator Mike Enzi and Senator Leland Christensen. They both have a history in this body and continue to serve Wyoming long after they made their impressions here and they will both be sorely missed. I know there are others that we missed this last year too, friends and family. Some of you may know that Bobby Barrasso had a significant surgery the other day, but I'm happy to report to you that she is recovering well with her husband, Senator John Barrasso at her side, and they ask for your best wishes and prayers to be sent their way. So here's the deal. I promised Jenny that we'd be together on Valentine's Day. <laughs> but I guess I forgot to mention it would be to open the budget session. But you all know that I'm an incurable romantic, and these are my witnesses. So I hope you'll understand that love has to conquer all. Seriously, though, Jenny. I love you and I want you to know, and everyone to know, what your work with the Wyoming Hunger Initiative has done for this great state. Programs like Food from the Field, Food from the Farm and Ranch, one of my favorites that we'll talk about a little bit later, grow a little extra. They've just made the lives of so many citizens better, and you've shown how Wyoming takes care of our own. It's an honor to be here with Chief Justice Fox, Justices Coutts, Boomgarden, Gray, and newly robed Justice Fenn. There he is. For your information, Justice Fox and I have a bet going. Who can be shorter? <laughs> but I'm also joined by Secretary of State Ed Buchanan, Auditor Christy Racinas, Treasurer Kurt Meyer, and now, on the job in his second week, Superintendent Brian Schrader. Thank you for the opportunity to serve with you. This is a all-star cast. <laughs> Over the last couple of years, Wyoming has faced down many challenges. Together, we've emerged stronger, more engaged, and better equipped to tackle new challenges and seize fresh opportunities. As I was thinking about this state of the state, I was thinking about the June mornings of my youth when my family drove our cattle to the mountain. The hardest and longest days always came about midway through that drive, and we were already tired from 2 a.m. risings for an entire week before that. Regardless of whether it was snowing, raining, or clear, dusty, or muddy, the day, that day we rode nine miles from our barn, gathered, mothered, and started our cattle up the slip a steep and rocky and densely timbered trail. Beyond the elements, there was always a challenge that came up. A bull might duck off in a canyon or a calf might break back. The day was brutal for our horses and exhausting for us, especially as a little kid. 
That drive had to be completed before sunrise, and the day became too hot. And it meant most of it happened in the dark. It was a hard pull, and at times it seemed like it was never going to end. Here in Wyoming, we've had a hard pull too over the past couple of years. And folks are wondering if the end will ever come into view. But I believe we're beginning to see the first rays of our sunrise. Over the past couple of years, Wyoming people kept working, our students kept learning. Instead of rolling over when DC mandates came our way, we countered and led coalitions of states to test the constitutionality of federal vaccine mandates, leasing moratoriums, and we offered aid to secure our borders. Despite tremendous challenges, Wyoming is strong and getting stronger. We're strong because of our character, resilient because of our nature, and optimistic because Wyoming people are doers. We respect folks who get things done, not naysayers or critics. Part of the reason that I believe there is an undeniable momentum in Wyoming these days is that we can feel that momentum in businesses as they rebound and as we see our unemployment fall away to the lowest level since 2008. Part of that reason we can feel good about ourselves is the good work of the National Guard. And I want to take a moment to recognize these folks represented today by Adjutant General Greg Porter and Jackie Morey, who are up in the gallery. General Porter calls our guard the sword and the shield of Wyoming, and they've earned it. These men and women are essential to our national security, but they've also pulled shifts in Wyoming's hospitals and long-term care facilities, delivered supplies, fought fires across the wet west, and generally made our lives much more secure. And I'm proud of our airmen and women, our soldiers, and our civilians. General Porter and Major Morey, thank you for your service. You know, you know, the world has become a decidedly scarier place with China and Russia rattling sabers. Bear in mind that what's happening in the Ukraine, even as we speak, is as much about energy as it, about, as it is about geopolitics and security. The old adage, of peace through strength remains true. That's why our nation's nuclear arsenal remains absolutely essential. We can be proud that Wyoming will remain a critical component of our no nuclear triad. F.E. Warren Air Force Base, just up the street, will remain a central element of the new ground-based strategic deterrent. And Wyoming has always welcomed members of our armed forces as family. There's a relationship here in Cheyenne that's historic, and accordingly, I'd like to recognize Colonel Catherine Barrington, and commander of the 90th Missile Wing, and the 90th Missile Wing Command Chief Master Sergeant Nicholas Taylor. Colonel and Command Chief Master Sergeant, Wyoming is a patriotic state. And that's why I remind everyone that the words of Article 1, Sections 2 and 3 of our Wyoming Constitution speak clearly and emphatically about civil rights and equality for, and I quote here, all members of the human race. And that's why I also And that's why I also remind the world that in Wyoming, we always stand for our national anthem.
This patriotism is found in one of the most amazing museums anywhere in the world, the National Museum of Military Vehicles. It's the brainchild of Dan Stark, who's here with us today. Dan built this museum in Dubois and laid it out in an educational way. It tells a story about America's involvement in the world. I saw there the same vintage army ambulance that my dad drove in World War II, as well as the kind of riverboat that my business partner, friend, river rat, and former Senate President John Schiffer served on in Vietnam. There are lessons in that collection that every American needs to know. And I thank you, Dan, for putting Dubois on the list of must-visit places in Wyoming. You've helped us to remember who we are and how we got here. Dan, would you stand so that we can recognize you? Across this state, we're stepping up our efforts to remember our veterans. In a little over a month, we'll be recognizing the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. That war, perhaps more than most, reminds us of how important it is that our nation stands together and behind the men and women who fought to keep us free. There's more that needs to be done than just thanks as we appreciate those who have fought for our freedom. Far too many have suffered PTSD and other war-related injuries. Suicide remains an all too frequent event, especially for our veterans. And I ask you to consider using American Rescue Plan dollars to do more to fight against suicide. My budget also opens and staffs the new veteran skilled nursing facility in Buffalo. Particularly poignant for me this summer was the honor of attending the dedication of the new Path of Honor Veterans Memorial in Ethity, Wyoming. It was long in coming, but it's absolutely worth the wait. And I want to recognize our neighbors and fellow American citizens, the Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho. I will tell you, thank you. I will tell you, no other group of Americans has served in greater proportion than our Native Americans. But I have to say, we've always been able to enjoy direct, respectful, and committed dialogue between the tribes and the state, and that allows us to work through difficult issues and find a path that's beneficial to us all. And I'm pleased to recognize Chairman Jordan Dresser of the Northern Rappo Business Council and Wyoming liaison to the Eastern Shoshone, Marine veteran Lee Tendor. You know, I'm particularly grateful for our work with the business councils of both tribes in raising the issue of missing and murdered indigenous persons and improving enforcement procedures and victim services. Chairman Dresser is working on a documentary that will highlight this important issue to a much wider audience. We're proud to lead with you and Chairman St. Clair on stopping this devastating inhumanity. You know, there are two constitutional duties that need to be addressed in the coming days. Preparing a balanced budget for the upcoming biennium and making sure that legislative districts are properly reapportioned after the last census. Last year, you passed and I signed into law a strong voter ID law. Election integrity is essential. Wyoming is proud of its citizen legislators and it's proud of the way we select them. Wyoming's constitution obliges me to present a balanced budget. And the one you have before you this session is well-planned, transparent, and forward-looking. Appropriately, it's also a frugal one. We all recognize the challenges we've faced over the last couple of years, and it's encouraging that we've seen an uptick in our revenues. But even these have come in the teeth of the highest inflation rate we've seen in 40 years. Those of us building businesses at the time remember how devastating the cure to high inflation was to many of our farms and ranches, 
It crippled our energy businesses, and it changed Wyoming. That's why the budget I have submitted to you reflects a dual commitment to keep our state government operating effectively and efficiently, and to ensure Wyoming continues to live within her means. We haven't seen the end to the assault on our state's core industries perpetrated by this administration. Therefore, my focus must remain on the long-term fiscal viability of Wyoming and our ability to fight back. That's why I've proposed placing an additional 400 million in savings. I've also proposed several other actions to deal with inflation. My top priority is a market adjustment for state employees. I regard this as critical to the functioning of our state enterprise. From our troopers, snowplow drivers, social workers, and others, Wyoming is struggling to staff the very agencies that provide the services the people of Wyoming need. 90% of Wyoming state employees are earning less than their peers did five years ago. And 30% of our workforce need a second job just to make ends meet. We can't ignore these sobering facts. We must do better. Our towns and counties can. They're hiring away our staff. Neighboring states can. They're hiring away our staff. And they, I regard this market adjustment as absolutely essential and something that we cannot put off any longer. The actions of the Biden administration regarding public lands and energy are deeply flawed and clearly miss the mark. Instead, they hit Wyoming squarely in the breadbasket. Stopping the exploration and production of federal oil, gas, and coal means that our state bears a disproportionate burden of reduced royalties, reduced severance taxes, and reduced economic benefit. And for what? These actions won't reduce global warming or benefit consumers. Instead, they have caused inflation to soar. As a matter of fact, during 2021, while the Biden administration was limiting oil production in Wyoming, it increased Russian oil imports and called for more production from OPEC. So I ask you, does anyone in this room think there's an iota of common sense in that policy? Mr. Biden, tear up your energy policy. Let Wyoming power our country. Give us the tools and the chance to make the nation energy independent again. Wyoming has it all, the best wind, solar, gas, coal, nuclear, and the ability to soar over 50 years worth of our nation's carbon emissions. Innovation, not regulation, is our way forward to give our nation the energy it requires and simultaneously solve the world's climate concerns. We don't need to choose between fossil fuels or new types of energy. To quote the old baseball sage Yogi Berra, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And that's what we should do, because we need an all of the above energy strategy. One company. One company took Yogi's, Yogi's advice, l &H Industrial, is from Gillette, and it maintains a strong commitment to coal mining, but they've also taken their expertise to expand to alternatives like wind energy and even aerospace. Today, we're joined by Jason Persfield. He's the third generation of his family to help lead l &H and shows vision about where our state can go while respecting its core industries. Jason, will you stand so we might recognize you in the industrial spirit of Wyoming? Yeah. 
You know, we have a plethora of opportunities coming our way. Advanced nuclear, carbon capture utilization and sequestration, bioenergy, CCUS, hydrogen, as well as better, cleaner ways to burn and use our coal and other fossil fuels. Wyoming is leading the research on ways to keep our legacy industries viable and take up new ones as well. We must seize these opportunities, and we will by fighting ridiculous regulation, promoting sensible development, and embracing new opportunities. In this budget, I've asked for the ability to access 100 million so that we can be ready to, and I'll say this again, seize the opportunities that match federal and private investments in large-scale energy projects. That will help us innovate and grow our mineral and energy economies, and that is essential to our future. <laughs> Wyoming is committed to remaining an energy exporter. However, to export energy, we must have reliable, secure sources of transmission. Years ago, Wyoming was a leader in identifying transmission corridors, and I remain supportive and committed to ensuring that transmission lines to energy consumer states, particularly to our south and west, are established. Just the other day, Jenny was in Fremont County at the Farm and Ranch Days Symposium. You all know her passion has been for, to end food insecurity in Wyoming. When she got back, she saw a friend that we have here today, and she reminded me of a story about Bobby Lane, who works at the Honor Farm. Bobby knows how to grow hay. But when we had to cut budgets last year, Bobby was given a new task, grow vegetables for the Honor Farm. He was so successful that someone accused him of having two green thumbs. The trouble is, Bobby's a team roper. So it's an occupational hazard. He only has one thumb. But I, but I just digress. Bobby donated his excess produce to Jenny's Grow a Little Extra program. So here's the thing. Bobby raises food, but more importantly, he raises self-esteem. The inmates that tended to the garden have come away with an interest in farming and a chance to lead productive lives. And this is just another example of what state employees do. They go above and beyond. Bobby's here today. So Bobby, would you stand so we can recognize you? <laughs> First Lady and I have not been idle with regard to agriculture. We've engaged across the sector to promote our industry and look forward to doing even more in the years to come. As ranchers, Jenny and I know how critical water is to our lives. Water in Wyoming is sacred, and we need the ability to stand our ground when it comes to protecting it. The ongoing drought in the West has raised the stakes over water rights in the Colorado, the Snake, the Platte, and the Yellowstone drainages, just to name a few. When drought or the federal government threatens Wyoming's water users, agricultural producers, industry and communities, we can't afford to be shorthanded or unprepared. And that's why you'll see that I've asked for additional resources for both our state engineer and our attorney general. One continued bright spot for Wyoming though is our tourism industry. More people continue to come here to visit and enjoy what we love about this state. Revenue from lodging is now saving the general fund money and creating opportunities for new investments in outdoor recreation. People love Wyoming, and we need more camping spots, boat ramps, and trails so we can continue to provide more access to our great outdoors. Wyoming people love the outdoors. We love our wildlife, and we love our open space. And that's why now is the time to use one-time revenues to fill the Wyoming Wildlife and Natural Resource Trust. This investment will bring returns many times over for Wyoming, our ranches, our businesses, and our way of life. <clears throat> the 
The pandemic has revealed that the demands on Wyoming's healthcare system and the accompanying costs require a focused approach. And that's why I established the Health Task Force as a way for stakeholders to improve accessibility and affordability. We began by focusing on Wyoming's fragile emergency medical system. We need stability in emergency medical response in Wyoming. And the task force is recommending funding to standardize emergency medical dispatch. The Wyoming EMS system will be a top priority for me and the task force in 2022. Remember, our state's healthcare system, though, is only as effective as the people who work in it. Today with us is Will Deans, a critical care nurse at the Cody Regional Health Hospital. And Will's here with his family. Will and his colleagues have been dependably providing care for patients with COVID-19, along with the other ailments that require medical attention, regardless of pandemic waves. Will, will you and your family stand so that we may recognize you? Will, we thank you. I know it's been difficult, but thank you for standing in there. It's wonderful. One of our stop, uh, state's top priorities must be education. Wyoming schools were reported as having educated more kids in person, more days during the pandemic than any other school system in the country. Now that's amazing stuff. And when I report this to my colleagues, they ask, how did you do it? And I have to answer, it's been our school boards, our school staff, our students, parents, teachers, and communities, all that made it happen. And they deserve our gratitude. I want to take this opportunity to recognize Ann Oakes, an educator for over 30 years. Mrs. Oakes was elected to the Campbell County Board of Trustees in 2010 and has served as a board chair since 2017. She's a great example of how many Wyoming citizens are willing to serve their community on behalf of Wyoming students and families. And thank you for your courage and your leadership in this truly remarkable time and would you stand so that we might recognize you? There are a couple of other individuals that I'd like, that I'd like to recognize. The Wyoming Teacher of the Year from 2021, Alexis Barney, and the 2022 Teacher of the Year, Brittany Montgomery. You two have been just absolutely amazing, and your students know it. Alexis, sadly, was unable to join us today, but she is a fourth and fifth grade teacher at Evansville Elementary, and Brittany teaches first grade at Harrison Elementary in Green River. Your commitment to our children is critical to our state's future. Let's give them a hand. Brittany, could you stand? Yes, the future of our state does depend on a quality education system that helps students stay competitive in a changing world and continues to make Wyoming an attractive place to raise your family. But there's more to that equation than just cost. To that end, I've launched the Reimagining and Innovating the Delivery of Education Advisory Group, we call it the RIDE, to examine Wyoming's primary and secondary education system and make recommendations to elevate it into a position of national leadership. We can't do that without understanding what those closest to education expect from their schools. And that starts with parents, businesses, students, and community leaders. You know, we rightfully invest a lot in the education and development of our kids. 
But data show what we've all known for far too long. Our kids are leaving. The crux of this issue is a catch-22. Our children leave because they don't see long-term opportunities for employment or careers, and businesses are hesitant to relocate or expand because they're uncertain about their future workforce. But this is changing. Our focus on economic diversification has broken this catch-22. Wyoming kids have a work ethic that's second to none, and already new enterprises are coming, ranging from this advanced nuclear to digital assets to outdoor recreation, advanced manufacturing, and I could go on. Because they're seeing what Wyoming is doing to change the game. We're investing in new ways of looking at career and technical and higher education, and it's essential that we always stay ahead of this curve. We have to keep this momentum going, and that's what the Wyoming Innovation Partnership, or WIP, is all about. WIP was born of communication across community colleges and the university, but it quickly has evolved to include the Business Council and Workforce Services, and shortly, it will expand to include community economic development organizations and industry. All of these entities will be important in identifying opportunities and local needs, building curriculum, and importantly, measuring the performance of those programs. More than a set of just programs, it's a way of envisioning how Wyoming can use her unique strengths to attract, build, refine, and engage our entire capacity to advance Wyoming and diversify our economy. You know, in these times, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Wyoming is actually bursting with opportunities across all of our sectors. We want our education system to be part of the way we grow. WIP is all about more people who do and more people who can. I want to thank the presidents of our community colleges, UW, and the others who've nurtured this effort for their vision. Let me close by finishing the story of our cattle drive. When we got to the top of the slip, we knew the drive would get a little bit easier. But to be there, just as the sun came up, and I could look out over the red hills of my home and see the pumpkin buttes to the east, and I could see the bighorns to the north, I could smell the pine, hear a metal lark. Being there on a Wyoming morning, on a good horse, with a sense of accomplishment and a clearer path forward, that's a feeling that I will never forget. Things were right with the world and our job would become easier. It made all the struggle of the earlier darkness worth it. And so it is with our state these past few years. You know, as governor, I'm often asked, why are you so optimistic? And it's simple. To paraphrase a wise man, what lies behind us are small matters compared, what to, com compared to what lies ahead, and that depends on what lies within us. Members of the 67th legislature, thank you for your service to the state. Thanks to your families that are here or at home supporting you. I especially want to thank President Dockstetter and Speaker Barlow for their leadership through these trying times and for their friendship. I know for some of you, this could be your last session. Others are just starting. But together, we can and must do much for Wyoming. Let us move forward with courage, confidence, and conviction. To me, there's a lot that comes up with the term cowboy. It's not a big hat, angora shaps, or tough talk. Cowboy is a decent, practical, working sort of person whose humility is infectious and ability knows no bounds, and who would do anything for a buddy, knows horses, and is not afraid to admit his mistakes. Right now, the world needs more cowboys. Thank you. Thank you.
God bless Wyoming. God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Governor Gordon, on behalf of the members of the legislature, I thank you for attending this joint session and for your message to us. Thank you, Governor. <laughs> members of the 66th legislature, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I now present the Honorable Kate Fox, Chief Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court. Mr. Speaker. Governor Gordon, I think I can beat your time. <laughs> Madam First Lady, members of the 66th legislature, elected officials, members of the judiciary, guests, and citizens of the great state of Wyoming. It's an honor for me to speak to you today on behalf of the Wyoming Judicial Branch. Thank you, President Dockstadter and Speaker Barlow, for the invitation to do so. A couple was returning home from walking their two dogs when one of the dogs, Rocky, broke loose, ran across the street, and attacked the neighbor's dogs on their front porch. Some kids playing basketball nearby gave chase, and one young man grabbed Rocky and dragged him into the street while the dog fight continued. The neighbor came out of the house and shot Rocky who went limp in the young man's hands. The neighbor was charged with the crimes of cruelty to animals and reckless endangerment. He went to trial, and a jury of his peers, guided by the judge, decided the outcome of the case. The courts are there so that people have a place to solve their differences when other avenues aren't available. That's how we do it in America. Our Wyoming courts are there for criminal cases where the state must prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. For neglect and abuse cases, when the court oversees the reasonable efforts to reunify children with their families. For divorces, when couples can no longer continue their marriages. For multi-million business disputes between corporations. Our courts manage collection and eviction cases, protection orders, probates, and guardianships. They handle traffic tickets. And courts are where you go to establish and defend your constitutional rights. There are 24 circuit court judges, 24 district court judges, five Supreme Court justices, and a few magistrates in the Wyoming judicial branch. There are at least a couple of judges in each of your districts, and I hope you know them. If you don't, I invite you to go make their acquaintance. We have only about 265 employees in the judicial branch to support the work of those judges. They work incredibly hard, and I must tell you, we are struggling to retain our good people. There are a number of reasons for that, but chief among them is that they are underpaid. We have about 120 circuit court clerks across the state. Our court clerks are the workhorses of the judicial branch. They work in the highest volume courts where small claims and misdemeanors are filed, often by people who are not represented by lawyers. The clerks are there to help your constituents, the citizens of Wyoming, and to support the work of the judges so the people's legal matters can be addressed timely. That breaks down 
when we can't keep our good people. And we can't keep them because they can make more money at McDonald's or even in the same building working for the county. In our administrative staff, we have a small but powerful team of skilled people who maintain the court's IT and who are working on the critical e-filing project, which I will tell you more about. We keep losing those talented people to the private sector. What it means is we're challenged to complete our projects with one leg tied up. We must pay our people a fair wage if the courts are to continue to perform our constitutional functions. That is to provide the just, speedy, and inexpensive resolution of our citizens' disputes. For that reason, we support the governor's proposal for state employee pay increases. We have not asked for new positions in this budget except out of the ARPA funds. But the truth is budget cuts has, have also reduced our positions to such an extent that our good people simply cannot perform all the functions that we ought to. In the most recent budget cuts, we eliminated three positions. We need those back. These positions would be distributed to the administrative staff, which supports all the courts, and to circuit courts, which have critical staffing shortages. I know that you're reluctant to use short-term funds for positions, and I understand that. But if ARPA funds can give us even temporary relief, we'll take it and we'll put it to good use. We need those three positions to adequately serve the people of Wyoming and to the, retain the good people we have who, frankly, are burning out. We've also requested three temporary time-limited trainers so that we can train our clerks to get the maximum benefit from the new case management system. We have ever-increasing demands for data from the judicial branch, and many of those come from this legislature. We agree that accurate data is critical to many decisions that all three branches make. But sound data starts with reliable and consistent input, and we need trained people to do that. I must add that from what I see, the executive branch agencies we work closely with are suffering from the same lack of resources. For example, the Department of Family Services is involved in most cases that come before our juvenile courts. But it's not unusual to see in the appeals that come before us in the Supreme Court, DFS workers testifying, and there are a number of them for each case. It's never a good thing to have multiple caseworkers in the life of a case that requires establishing rapport with the families and determining what their specific needs are. But that's one of the ways that low pay for state workers impacts the work of the courts and the people of Wyoming. For another example, we also work closely with the Department of Corrections in our treatment court programs, which are incredibly successful. Our judges depend on each member of the treatment court teams, not least of which are the probation officers. But because of budget cuts and reduced staffing, probation officers are no longer always able to devote the time that our judges would like to have from them. I do not say this to criticize those agencies. We have really excellent relationships with our justice partners in the executive branch. That's DFS, corrections, health, and law enforcement. I think they're doing their utmost with the resources they have. But as then Chief Justice Davis told you last year, you can't keep cutting the rations and expect your soldiers to keep fighting a mighty battle. Cutting government sounds good until you're reducing the services to the citizens of Wyoming to such an extent that basic structures fall apart. Left untended, the cost down the road will only be greater. While I'm talking about investment in the citizens of Wyoming, I want to address a top priority for the judicial branch, and that is the matter of three additional district court judges. According to our workload studies, we've been short a district court judge in the third, the seventh, and the sixth judicial districts for many years. 
we must ensure that the people in those three districts, and that's Natrona, Campbell, Crook, Weston, Sweetwater, Lincoln, and Uinta counties, continue to receive the just, speedy, and inexpensive resolution of their legal disputes. And we need to make sure our judges have a workload that is sustainable. I am extremely proud of the overall quality of our judges in Wyoming, but I see a problem looming. We're getting fewer and fewer applicants for judicial vacancies, and I think they're not applying because they see what a difficult and unrelenting grind that job is. To attract and retain good judges, we must ease that grind. The Joint Judiciary Committee passed a bill to add district court judges in each of those three districts. For each district court judge with a staff of three, we budget 1.2 million per biennium. And I wouldn't ask you if I didn't think we needed that to continue to deliver justice to the citizens of Wyoming. Even though Dave Barry said the only positive thing to be said about 2021 is that it was marginally better than 2020, I do have some good things to report about accomplishments in the judicial branch since the last state of the judiciary. First and foremost, our courts continued to dispense justice this year, when many courts throughout the nation were barely limping along. Our Wyoming judges and court staff have done an extraordinary job of keeping the courts open and taking care of the citizens' needs in the face of some daunting challenges. With the foresight of the legislature and the governor and the help of some CARES Act money, we made some giant leaps in technology use in our courts. And now, looking beyond the pandemic, we will embrace a new normal that saves time, travel, and money for litigants, as well as for the courts. But there was more than technology that made it possible to keep cases moving and trials happening. It was hard work and an attitude of finding creative solutions by the folks who work for the courts. If our courtrooms weren't big enough to accommodate social distancing, they improvised, like Judge Blumel does, by using the historic roundhouse in Evanston for jury selection. If it was difficult or unsafe for people to bring their papers to the court, we accepted email filing, even though it meant extra steps for the clerks of printing and scanning those documents. Our clerks and judicial assistants, court reporters, law clerks, and judges had the attitude that they would get it done, and they did. The Wyoming judiciary was ahead of most of the nation in conducting its work remotely, and it has been ahead of most of the nation in resuming in-person proceedings. <laughs> Our circuit courts now have a full year under their new case management system, and it's important to distinguish between case management which is the system of filing and docketing cases, and e-filing, which allows people outside the courts to file electronically. Circuit courts do not have e-filing, but one of our top ARPA money requests is for circuit court e-filing. We've begun the rollout of the updated electronic case management system in the district courts. Today, three of our district courts are on the new case management system. And that's a big deal because once we have case management in place, we can get e-filing going. Chancery Court, open for business December 1st, 2021. <laughs> Thank you, we are proud of that accomplishment. It is totally electronic. Uh, so that means e-filing and everything. Uh, we anticipate it's going to take some time for the filings to build up enough to justify a full-time chancery court judge. In the meantime, we have two of our district court judges who are pitching in to carry that load until there's enough to get a new judge on board. And the chancery court courtroom 
uh, will be ready for business, I think, in the next few months in the Casper office building. I also have some changes to report in the judges' ranks. Judge Robert Denhart, who was circuit court judge in the 9th Judicial District in Lander, retired in October. He's replaced by Judge Jefferson Combs. Judge Bruce Waters, circuit judge in the 5th Judicial District in Cody, retired in December. He's replaced by Judge Joey Dara. Judge John Perry, district court judge in the 6th Judicial District in Gillette, retired in January. He's replaced by Mike Causey. Judge Timothy Day, district judge in the 9th Judicial District in Jackson, also retired in January. He's replaced by Judge Melissa Owens. Justice Michael Davis, who served as Chief Justice for the past three years and who will be sorely missed by the citizens of Wyoming and by me especially, retired in January. Justice John Finn, who was the district judge in Sheridan, has now joined us on the Supreme Court. There's more though. Judge Thomas Rumpke, district court judge in the 6th Judicial District in Gillette, has returned to private practice. He will be replaced by Circuit Court Judge Matt Castano. And Judge Fenn's district court seat in Sheridan is now open. Governor Gordon will be making that decision any day now, I think. So as you can see, the Judicial Nominating Commission has been very busy. It's been an honor and a pleasure for me to chair that committee of thoughtful and conscientious people and to be part of Wyoming's merit selection system. There is no better system for selecting qualified people to serve as judges with their eye on the ball, and that is to apply the rule of law. We have an important transition in the judicial branch administrative staff that I have to tell you about. Deputy Court Administrator Rhonda Munger, who many of you know because she's been an essential part of almost every aspect of court administration for almost 20 years, has taken a different job with the Supreme Court as Justice Fenn's judicial assistant. We thank Rhonda and all the judges who have served for their many years of faithful service, and we thank those who have stepped up to take over these important roles. I have some good things to report for the coming year. We will have e-filing in our first district court this summer. <laughs> that rollout will continue in each district court until they're all done in 2025. And here I have to thank all the judges and lawyers who've served on our committees to get all the things done, rules, protocols, uh, complicated procedures that go into the shift to e-filing. It's a lot of work. We depend very much on the volunteer committees to get it done. I hope this year we'll have an upgrade to our appellate case management system for the Supreme Court. The electronic system has passed end of life, and in fact, this legislature approved uh, that project two years ago, and then in last year's budget cuts took it back. So we cannot keep going on duct tape, and uh, I hope you'll approve that exception request as the JAC has done. I also hope we can get a new baseline workload study done for the circuit courts. This is how we determine the right number of judges and clerks to handle their caseloads. Because of the new case management system, the old baseline study is no longer valid, and we're requesting $250,000 to complete that study for the circuit courts. And yes, when the district courts are all online, we will come back and ask you for money for that baseline study. Our Access to Justice Commission and Equal Justice Wyoming will continue their work to find more opportunities for self-represented litigants. 
People who can't afford a lawyer but still must try to navigate the courts in civil cases. Thanks to the funds the legislature provided in the 2010 Civil Legal Services Act and grants, including a significant grant recently from the Hughes Foundation, Equal Justice Wyoming has been able to enhance its support of civil legal services toward the goal of liberty and justice for all. We have made it a judicial branch priority this year to support, enhance, and build on the state's treatment courts. Treatment courts are the most successful intervention for leading people with substance use and mental health disorders out of the justice system and into lives of recovery and stability. We're working closely with the Department of Health and Department of Corrections. We're focusing on training and taking stock so that we could see what works and do more of that in Wyoming. And I want to mention a new project that I just learned of recently, led by former Attorney General Pat Crank, to evaluate Wyoming's juvenile justice system and find better ways to address juvenile delinquency, abuse and neglect, chins, mental health, and substance abuse. That initiative is just getting off the ground, and I'm excited to see what the work group can accomplish with your help for juvenile justice. Talking about treatment courts and juvenile justice, it is apparent that all roads lead to mental health and substance abuse. That's true of the criminal cases as well. Our trial judges across the state will tell you that we need more mental health resources and local resources are better than out-of-town resources. Of course, our courts will continue to be open to the citizens of Wyoming so that their legal disputes from dog fights to corporate dissolution can be timely and fairly resolved. But we are constantly looking for ways to continue to deliver on fulfilling our constitutional promises as effectively as possible. Toward that end, our Board of Judicial Policy and Administration has just embarked this month on a project to look at reform and modernization of the judicial branch. Our combined budget request for the 23-24 biennium is about $91.9 .9 million, which is only about 3% of the state's general fund. And we get a lot of bang for the buck. You may have noticed the state of the judiciary does not include many facts and figures. That's because, although I know you rely on accurate information, I don't think the place for facts and figures is in this speech after you've been sitting here for so long. I want to paint the big picture of the judicial branch for you and to address our most pressing issues. We do have a great deal of information on the Wyoming Judicial Branch website. There you'll find updates on e-filing, the Chancery Court, past workload reports, the operating plans of each and every trial court. Most of our Judicial Learning Center exhibits are also on the website, and much more. We've also provided each of you with a fact sheet that's full of figures. Justice Keith Couts has a continuing invitation to put on a law school for legislators. And of course, our excellent administrative staff and I are available to answer any questions you may have. At some point in the state of the judiciary, I have to say the state of the judiciary is strong. And I say that this year with special conviction. In the past year or two, Wyoming's judiciary has demonstrated its strength, its resilience, and its determination to accomplish its goal. And it has done so with flying colors. That's because of our excellent people. And it's also thanks to the strong and steadfast report support that we've received from the legislature and the governor. Thank you for your past support, and thank you in advance for your support of the judicial branch's critical needs in the coming session. I look forward to our branch's continued collaboration with the legislative and executive branches. I know that we all share the same intentions, and that is to act in the best interest of the citizens of Wyoming. 
The founders of our republic and our state intended for there to be tension between the three branches of government so that we can keep the balance necessary to maintain the rule of law and preserve our democracy. I appreciate that despite that tension, relations between our branches continue to be cordial and respectful. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you and thank you for your service. Before we excuse our visitors, I'll turn the chair over to Speaker Barlow for a presentation to Wyoming's First Lady. So thank you, President Dockstader. Um, this is where the chief clerks get nervous because there's not a script. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, it's, it is Valentine's Day and the work that the First Lady has done on behalf of the uh, people of Wyoming touches our hearts. In fact, there's a particular uh, campaign, I think, Hearts for Hunger right now. Um, so with that in mind, the members of the legislature are going to present a uh, contribution toward that effort from our own citizen legislator pockets um, towards your effort. And the number is growing, but we're starting with $5,000 toward um, the First Lady and the wonderful work she does on behalf of Wyoming citizens. So from the members of the Wyoming House of Representatives and the Wyoming Senate to the Hunger Initiative and First Lady Jenny Gordon. First Lady Jenny, it, the check may be small, but it comes from a big heart, a Wyoming heart. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, First Lady, for all you do. Senators Driscoll and Hicks and Representative Summers and Connolly, please escort the First Lady of Wyoming and the governor from the chamber. Senators Perkins and Nethercott and Representatives Washington and Provisena, please escort the Chief Justice from the chamber. Thank you to our other guests and thank you for attending.